Diana Rodriguez Quevedo, and I'm a professor here at UE. This is my third year. I teach uh, courses in Spanish, so I've never been really teaching English. Um, people call me, students call me profesora. Never call me in English. I was born in Colombia, South America, and um, but I moved to Canada. I lived in Montreal and in Toronto as a child, and then my whole family moved back to Colombia, and we lived, so we lived in the city for a while, and then we lived in the mountains. And at that time, there were only two phones in the town where I lived. We had no hot water, no one had hot water. If you wanted hot water, it's boil it. Um, there were, um, we used telegrams, probably never heard of telegrams. <laughs> That's what we used, or you just went to people's houses and shouted out, because there weren't doorbells, it was just countryside, so you shouted out. <coughs> someone heard you and came up and reached you. So very different kind of life. Um, and that really, at the time I was 15, so I wasn't so excited after having lived in, in big cities such as Montreal and Toronto and Bogota, big urban cities. Um, but I am very grateful for the experiences that that gave me. And I think that you know the places where you'll be in, in Guatemala will be huge, um, I will have a you know, big effect on you as, as people and as, um, as students, and I wish you the best of experiences. So today I'm here to speak with you about Guatemala. I've never been there. One of my very best friends is from there, so I know a lot about, you know, the country through her and through readings of my own, mainly through literature. I'm a literature um, um, graduate, and so you learn a lot through literature. And so today I'll be, I'll be, I may go over some of the things that you've gone over, some greetings, some gestures, and things that maybe others have talked to you about. Um, and then other than that, I'm going to talk to you about the culture, some of the politics. I had given you an article, and I know you're all very busy. I know that you be like, it's very busy. I hope you had time to read it. If you didn't, it's good airplane reading. Okay, if any of you are, are wondering what to read on the flight. Uh, it is, it's mainly, it deals with, uh, not so much with the culture, more with the politics, some of the economics and the structure. So if you haven't read it, the way I, I prepared today's um, session is, um, I know you saw a movie, and, um, and so I've seen that movie. I had never seen it, but I did see it, just because I wanted to know where, more or less where you were starting from. So what I have today, is the movie came first, the reading came, was the next part after the, the making of the documentary. What I'm gonna present today at towards the end is the next stage of what's happened uh, economically and politically in the country since, uh, since the Civil War. So it's kind of in, in three stages and since you've seen that documentary, I will actually make reference to that at some point. But I'm gonna cover all kinds of little bits and pieces Please stop me at any time. Questions, comments, um, anything. It just, if anything comes to mind, it's better now than leaving it for the end. So if anything comes to mind, stop me. Okay. All right, so we'll get started. We're going to see a little bit about the country. So this is Guatemala. Has anyone been to Guatemala before? Anybody? Victoria has, yes. Central America? Any of you been to Central America? Where else? I've been in Mexico. Okay. Mexico. Some consider that North America, but okay. <laughs> yes, okay. I think econo economically it's North America. But, um, all right, so Guatemala, which is just south of Mexico and then connects with Honduras and El Salvador and to the south and connects with Belize, which is suspended, an English speaking country. Okay, so this is its equivalent to this, to, in terms of size to the state of Tennessee. So to kind of give you an idea. Some just basic things it's always good to know before you go to a place. Sometimes it's just to have conversation with the locals, just showing that you take an interest, that you, you, know, you have some basic knowledge. So we call them Guatemalans in English. In Spanish is Guatemalteco. Guatemalteca, because it's a gender-based language, so female and masculine, feminine and masculine. The capital city is Guatemala City. The official language is Spanish, because it was a colony of us. 
Spain, but there are 21, some say 22 indigenous languages that are spoken every day. And some of those are Acateco, Quiche, Cachiquel, Quechi, um, and there are also the languages of the Zinca and Garifuna people. I'm not going to get into that. They're, they're very different kinds of cultures. They have their, their own way of eating, uh, dressing, their own music, their own, their, their own culture. Garifuna is not just in Guatemala. It's all throughout the Caribbean. It's the Garifuna people and Garifuna uh, culture, predominantly Afro-descendant. Um, and then in terms of ethnic groups, 56% are mestizo or as they are known in Guatemala, it's Ladino. They really don't use the word mestizo, they use Ladino. That's the combination of indigenous and European. So that combination at the time of colonization, it's the Ladino. And then there are some Ladino who are, um, who are poor, who, uh, and then there are the Ladino who are the elite who mainly control political economic uh, at, and, uh, at those stages. And the indigenous consist of 44% of the population. In Spanish, we say los indígenas for feminine and masculine. It looks like a feminine word, but it's actually, we can use it for both. Los indígenas, las indígenas. The word indios is condescending. And so please uh, avoid that. Or if you hear it, then you may know what con in what context people are referring to the indigenous people. Indios or indias is condescending and pejorative. So indígenas is the proper word to, to use in Spanish. Los o las indígenas, or feminine or masculine. And in terms of the government system, it's a democratic institutional republic. And if you saw that documentary and you've done the readings, you know, democracy takes on all kinds of meanings when we're talking about Latin America. And so they are experiencing a democratic government at this point. But throughout the Civil War, there were a number of dictatorships. And this is the flag of, uh, of Guatemala. Does anybody know what the emblem here is, what it is, or what it stands for? Anybody? Has anybody seen that before? Kind of bird. No? So I'll get to it a little bit later. OK, in terms of uh, the culture, Again, because there are many different indigenous people who speak different languages, and, it, and there are the Ladino, and there have been other influences, German influences and from other European places. There are different languages are spoken. The way religion or beliefs are expressed, coming together of uh, indigenous practices, um, then also the Afro-descendants, even though I'm not really going to be getting into, into that population and then European practices. So all that creates for very many ways of living life, thinking of life, believing in terms of your beliefs, religious beliefs. And so it is a, um, a culturally um, diverse country, even though we may not think so. With regard to education and literacy, especially for the indigenous population, there's little access and um, and because of the different languages, it has been really difficult. There hasn't been that much attention given to establishing schools for indigenous uh, populations in their languages. So uh, school officially is, is done in Spanish. And since many of the children, indigenous children, either can't access the schools, or once they do access, they, uh, they get to the school and realize they don't even understand what the teacher is saying because they don't speak the language. They don't speak Spanish. So it's a very complex situation with regard to um, resolving education, access to education, and education that would actually help the different uh, groups of population um, you know, grow and develop and, and prosper in however they deem that prospering is for them. There are different conceptualizations of, of, of living and of being healthy and successful within the different cultures and societies in Guatemala. Um, the indigenous populations have been throughout many, many decades underrepresented politically, um, though that, that has started to shift, especially since uh, the end of the Civil War and since the publication of Rigo Eta Menchu's um, testimony. You all, the documentary you saw, 
was she was the narrator of that. And so, has anybody ever read an excerpt or, or her whole testimony? It's available in English. It's not an easy read. She repeats herself a lot. She didn't write it. She met with the, with the writer for a number of sessions. They met in France. Enrico Huerta had to learn Spanish in order to speak with Elizabeth Burgos. They met for a number of sessions in France. And then she, she told her story in Spanish, and Elizabeth wrote it for her. But it is Rico Huerta Minchu's uh, testimony. And so it, it has, uh, it has, this is really what brought a lot of attention to the plight of the indigenous in Guatemala and led to, in part, the end of the Civil War. And there is David Stoll. Has anyone heard of David Stoll, an academic from the US? He does his rounds, the circuits of the conferences. He was at a conference where I was at in Washington, D.C. last year. And he went down and did research, interviewed the people that Rigoberta Menchu talks about, her brothers, her cousins, her neighbors. And he undoes her whole testimony. He says that she lied about a lot of the information she gave. And so he's published. He's now working on his second book. But in terms of, of um, <coughs> academ in, in academia, he's not very well appreciated or, or welcomed because of his, his perspective of going in and trying to undo her whole testimony. It was her family, it was her people. She was, as she claims that she was speaking for her people, she, she had cleared that um, she hadn't, in fact, um, she didn't remember all the details. She wasn't present or a witness for all the events that she claims to, to mention in her book. So there's, in case you come across any conversations with the locals and that, just so that you know that there's still these two kind of wavelengths, but that Rico and Juk has done a lot for the people of the uh, indigenous in Guatemala, that she is very well respected for her work, not just for the indigenous, but worldwide for, for peace. Um, and in Guatemala, definitely. So in case, you know, it's good to just kind of know where, where things are at. With regard to religion, as I was saying, the, the coming together of indigenous groups and then the colonizers, the Spaniards, led to uh, syncretic religious practices, beliefs, the coming together of the different religions. And so, uh, primarily, it's the Roman Catholic religion that is practiced, even by the by the Mayan, by the indigenous. But they do tend to combine certain elements of, of their different uh, beliefs and their practices. And so here, there are just some images for you to kind of get a feeling. Protestant Pentecostal is a growing um, kind of part of uh, Christian religion. And then with the uh, syncretic religion, which is, you know, the coming together of the European, the Catholic religion, and then the indigenous. The names and the ways gods and saints are, are, are viewed or understood. The names get blended. New names are adapted. Different, you know, appreciation of the gods and the saints. Is anybody familiar with any of that? Anybody study religion? No? So you may see, even though someone claims to be Catholic, the way they practice their religion may be a little bit different than a Catholic would practice it here in Evansville or North America. Yes? What percentage of the population is this uh, Roman Catholic or Catholic? I can't remember. It's a majority. High, majority, really? big majority. And what Catholic. happened to the indigenous religions? Were they, they oppressed and killed off? Or? No, they blend. They ended blended up blending as happened in most of Latin America. And okay. that's what, the, yes, syncretism. It was kind of the coming together. And then where we have black populations, it's a it's a kind of a blending in a different way. It takes on another, you know, because it's different names and different practices. So the blending will will ch change a little bit according to the language that each group speaks and the way they, their cosmology, the way they understand life, the origin of life, afterlife. So it will be a little bit different for for each group. Yeah, just their understanding of creation and life itself and and the role that we play with regard to gods or a god. Mm -hmm. yes. How they blended them? Some of them have blended like the Mayan culture. How they it's, do they still keep some of like the Mayan traditions? It's all it's all come together. 
So where you may have a specific practice in the Catholic religion, they'll have other overtones or undertones with names or the way they will behave or how they'll light a, a candle or they won't or at what time of day or night they'll practice. So it's all those other subtleties. And I can't tell you because there are so many ways I could tell you about in Colombia because I, I have seen how that syncretism has taken, you know, has, has um, been represented, but I, I don't know like the fine details and it will change from one one location and one group in, our, in, in uh, Guatemala to another. And the language has a lot to do with that. Because language is a way of, of uh, expressing oneself. So words have you know nuances and different different expressions. It's not straight translation. So language is very important too with regard to uh, religion and, and beliefs. Um, indigenous dress for women. Typically, Mayan descendants will wear according to the region. Each region has their own typical dress, and I don't know, I can't tell you to distinguish all of the different ones, but they will know women and men amongst themselves from different regions, know where they come from because of the way their clothes are made, the patterns, uh, the colors that are used, the way the panels usually for the, this is called the wipi. Traje is all of it. Will be the headdress, the top, the bottom, Wipi is usually the the top. It's it's usually made of two or three panels, rectangular, and then they're they're put together for the top. That's the Wipi. But each different uh, group of indigenous have their own style of Wipi with their own weaving, their own colors, their own combinations, and they know where people come from because of the way they dress, because of their patterns, their color, their weaving styles. Um, but I I. I can't help. You know, once you spend enough time in a place, you do. You recognize. You learn to recognize by the way people speak, the way they dress. Um, but then also the different kinds of the way what they wear on their hair, on their head, and the way it's the folding, the creasing, all of that. Their jewelry is another aspect to identify what region they come from. So, again, it's a lot, and you know, you're there for a week. But just be. Mindful, be appreciative of the different ways that you may see people presenting themselves. For women, to this day, Mayan descendants will stoop still, and now even more so with pride, and as a way of uh, really uh, reappropriating their culture, they do dress in the typical, typical dress. Men fluctuate. So men who choose to still to wear their traditional uh, wear. This is this would be, so it's the kind of three pieces that they would wear, but most men will dress as in North Americans or Europeans. North American t-shirt, jacket, pants. Some men will wear the top that is in th of, their, of, their, of their group, they're indigenous, and then they'll wear regular pants, jeans, and so it's just interesting to see how, depending on the space where they'll be or with their community or if they have to go to the bank or if they have to go into the city, how they may change the way they dress because of the purpose of their, of their interactions or what they need to get done. Weaving uh, typically has been done by women. And if you observe the position, sometimes women sit with their legs stretched out. There are mainly two positions when they're weaving. One is with their legs, and I could not do that, sit there for hours and hours with their legs fully stretched out front or kneeling like this. And hours and hours just weaving and knowing the patterns, the colors. And for people who have studied weaving in, in the different cultures, indigenous cultures, a way to interpret it is like an extension of their body. So it's an extension of their identity. The loom, the, the wool, and the colors represents you, represents your identity, extends you, it becomes part of you. So you're a part of it, and it is a part of you. So weaving is very, very important for the indigenous, uh, indigenous groups, especially for women. It really, um, then wearing what you have woven is that true kind of, you know, the indigenous um, persona and identity. It is your, your ancestors 
and it connects you to the, your community and the people that you are with. So the whole process of weaving, processing the cotton, the wool, dyeing it, weaving it, and then wearing or gifting the artifacts that you make is a very kind of sacred activity. It's an economic activity, and it's a life-sustaining to dress, but it, it is also, it goes beyond that in terms of what it represents, especially for the women. And, and then for the children, the female girls. They learned that at a very young age, and so it's, it's part of, of, a, of a role that you play for being female, for being indigenous, and Guatemala. And the way you represent or present yourself is part of your identity. Um, weaving is also part of the, you know, it's an, a, a commercial activity, and I believe you will have a chance to do a bit of shopping. I'm not sure what kind of place you will. Is it more like a, a, a market? A market. Uh -huh. So then you'll, you'll you'll have a chance to see many of the wares that they have. Here are some of the main ones. So handicrafts, they've been made since pre-colonial -colonial times. There is a high demand mainly for tourists also for collectors and for museums. So different kinds of pieces for different places. Um, over the last, I'd say, I don't know, a few decades, there's been an increase in terms of exportation. So women producing their goods, not just for themselves as a representation of who they are, but also for, uh, for exportation. And most of that is done through middlemen. So the, the women who make the goods often get very little for them. So again, be mindful like there is bargaining, often there is uh, bargaining for locals, there may be bartering in that, but for you, just be mindful that uh, usually at markets like that, you'll be able to counter offer and, you know, and make sure it works to your benefit, but also be mindful of the hours that have gone and the materials and that that have gone into what, what you're purchasing. So again, what Melissa what Marissa was saying about respect, that's part of respect, right? And, and that kind of trading. Uh, Hand-woven items <coughs> made of cotton or wool, textiles and clothing. Also baskets, ceramic goods, hard uh, wooden furniture, utensils. These are very popular. Uh, they're usually very well made, durable. And other decorative items, as well as beaded and silver jewelry some of the things you might encounter when you go to the market. Talking a little bit more about the, the dress, um, there was a piece in the, in the documentary you saw about Miss Guatemala mm -hmm. and then how the impact of um, American wear, and I think it was the Wrangler jeans that they were wearing as they were. And so it's interesting how it's mainly, there's never been a Miss, Miss Guatemala who is indigenous. It's always the Latino woman, usually from the elite or upper higher class, who, you know, is even makes it to the anywhere near the ranks of Miss Guatemala. But it's interesting to see how, as part of the pageant, there's always a, a part of the pageant where they will wear the the traditional indigenous huipil and traje, the people. Okay, so it's interesting that reappropriation. There are times where the the dominating culture and population will reappropriate the indigenous to represent that national identity. The national identity, Guatemala often is by the colorful tapestries and clothing, the indigenous, that, that typical indigenous is that Guatemalan identity. So when it serves the Latino some purpose in terms of the world forum, they will appropriate. The, the, the indigenous values and expressions of identity, such as Miss Guatemala, it's part of that. And this was 1975. She won for the most, uh, the best traditional wear in, in at the Miss Universe pageant. So it's it's just interesting to interpret. You know, when we think indigenous, all the many meanings uh, that it has and the importance it has at the local, micro local, local national and then international levels. Here we have the Quetzal. See, Quetzal is the bird. Uh, it comes from the Nahuatl language. It's the emblematic uh, bird of Guatemala, and it's the name, the currency is called Quetzal. Okay, so Quetzal used to, is uh, in ancient Mayan people, 
used to use the feathers or the plumes as their currency. And so it remained the name state from that. We no longer use the feathers, but we use the quetzal, which is the currency. And here is one moon quetzal. Okay, so this is snowbird on there. You know, it's different, but that's where quetzal, the history of the quetzal. A little bit now into socioeconomics. So it, uh, Guatemala depends highly on agriculture. One eighth of, uh, of the GDP is comes from agriculture. It is considered one of the poorest countries in the hemisphere. And it has, as you can see from the documentary, and if you did the reading, I recommend it, you can see there's a long standing, just huge um, political, ethnic, social, and even economic divisions. And the poor, the very, the very poor, and then the very, very rich. Those who feel they have no voice, and those who, you know, represent themselves and have power and uh, political and economic social power. Um, after World War II, the country started to have social reforms, and they were looking at doing also uh, agrarian reforms, so redistribution of the land, so it would be more e equitable. Um, and they started, the country started to look into establishing a social uh, security system. And that was at the time of uh, President Ives. So this is, I often like to see what's on the front, on the cover of Time Magazine. For me, it's like a barometer of what's going on in the world, whoever's on that cover. So this was 19, June 1954, and Ives was on the cover of, of uh, the president at the time of Guatemala. And so he was president from 51 to 54. Uh, he nationalized the United Fruit Company, uh, the banana plantations. And in 1940s, Guatemala was uh, represented a quarter of the United Fruit Company production in Latin America. So the United Fruit Company was huge, at, you know, huge in terms of labor, workforce, um, political and economic power. In, in all of Latin America, but mainly in Guatemala, it was, it was the poor. 1954, Ardenz, he's starting all these social pro uh, uh, projects and security system and trying to redistribute the land. And there's a coup that was um, sponsored and prepared by the US. And so that's when we start with um, a series of military, military dictatorships. So that was the end, 1954 was the end of the agrarian reforms. And from then on, there were you know, systematic problems of inequality, uh, of personal land distribution, and the marginalization of, of uh, populations. Again, the very wealthy and then the poor, and amongst the poor are always the indigenous. There's also a large Latino population, but the indigenous fall into the category of the poor and marginalized. Any questions up until now? No. And all that is important. And I'll, I'm, you know, there's a whole sequence. There's a reason why I'm, I've got this order. So you'll see why it's important also for you to have in mind all this history, the economic and the politics for your one week visit there. So this is just so you have an idea of the, uh, you know, the importance of, of fertile land, the richness of agriculture, the people who work the land which is very different from the people who own the land. Uh, these are some of the fields in Guatemala. And as much as, as agriculture is so important for the economy of Guatemala, only 12% of the land is really fertile enough for, you know, for agriculture and to lead to export. Some of the typical, typical foods, and you'll probably be eating lots of these, so if you don't like corn, it's going to be a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so corn, lots of tortillas, uh, beans, rice, plantain. Has anyone had plantain before? Yeah or not? Yeah. There's so many ways to make it. It's sweet, it's, it's hard, it's crunchy, it's soft, it's salty, in soup, in a stew. I mean, you fry it, you, there's so many things you can do with it. You bake it, so plantain is a you know, main staple. Food. Chicken, pork. And coffee again, like beef, that's for the wealthy. The, the indigenous people, 
rarely even eat, um, you know, chicken and pork. But these are like the main um, staple foods. What uh, tamales? You've heard of tamales? Yes. Tamales are different. Even within Colombia, every region has its own type of tamal. So there are no tamales from one country to another that are the same. But Guatemala tamales are, they're a little bit, there's, well, Colombian tamales are huge. So <laughs> to me, Guatemalan tamales are, are small, but they're very yummy. And it takes a good two days to make them. So you have to prepare all the parts that are going to go in, and then you wrap them in the banana leaves, and then you, you steam them. So it's a whole family or two family affairs. The women from two or three families get together. They each contribute different parts, and then you spend time together making them. And it's yeah, it's it's um, it's mainly for special occasions, um, religious or in Colombia we we do them mainly for first communions and New Years, sometimes weddings. So in Guatemala, it's also it's for ceremony. It's not just you know Sunday lunch or you know, just any day of the week. They're really reserved for special occasions. What did you think? What? Where did you have them? I don't know. Peru. All Peru. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. low. Yeah. They'd be different. Yeah. Yeah. Different. Okay. Um, so you, usually there will be beans in there, corn, rice. Again, it's kind of whatever you've got, you put in here. You know, do you have some kind of meat or chicken or? depends what you can afford and what when the people come together to, to make them. This is just so you get an idea of what, you know, an indoor market and even for when it comes to food, people will bargain. And then amongst themselves they may barter as well. So it's a little bit different. In the big cities, I'm sure they you know they have grocery stores and, and pharmacies and things like that. But often especially in rural areas it's you know it's typical. And even in big cities they'll have indoor outdoor markets. Okay, daily meals. This is well we have desayuno. Can you repeat that? Desayuno. Desayuno. Breakfast. Okay? Breakfast. El almuerzo. El almuerzo. Okay. Lunch. La cena. La cena. La comida. La comida means food, but it also means dinner. And that's because lunch is really the main meal of the day. Okay, dinner usually is something small, like a bun or a sweet piece of bread and a coffee or you know something really small. That's dinner. Lunch is the main meal. So yeah, the biggest meal is at noon. Breakfast for the wealthy people. They'll have cereals. They'll have eggs. They'll have maybe some kind of meat. Um, they'll have bread, different kinds of breads. Um, for most most of the um, indigenous, they will have atol. Atol. It's a kind of gruel. It's a kind of um, a drink, and that could be made from cornstarch, cornmeal, oatmeal, and it's not really really thin. Sometimes it can be a little thicker or runnier, depending on how it's made. So this is very typical for breakfast for the indigenous people. So if you have a chance to try it, if you're adventurous, if it's offered to you, okay? So it will depend, you know, what it's made with. Um, and sometimes they'll have some kind of sweet bread and coffee. So those are usually their, their alternatives for the indigenous. Atol or sweet bread and coffee. Okay, eggs are they're not that common for the indigenous. And in, in most of Central America, not just Guatemala, food is understood as hot or cold, not because of the temperature. Um, it's, I don't really understand the whole system, but I have friends from El Salvador and Guatemala, and they'll tell me that avocado is a hot food, so you should not consume it past six in the evening, because it will be harder for you to, to digest it. And if you, for women, if you're on your period, there are some foods that you should avoid because it creates more heat, or creates and so menopause so it's it's a whole other way of conceptualizing food but it's not about what you eat when it's cold outside or what you eat when it's 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 hot or because of the way the temperature the food is served at it's a whole other if you've never heard of um, uh, Ayurvedic Ayurvedic medicine and Ayurvedic diets in India Pakistan again it's kind of looking at food 
with these elements of, if you've heard of yin and yang, yeah, kind of this positive and negative flowing, in, it's the whole conceptualizing, which I, in Colombia we don't, we don't have this way of conceptualizing food, but, but do, when, you, when you're there, maybe ask questions and try and, you know, get a little bit more. My, my Guatemalan friend doesn't, she doesn't partake in that, so I've been, you know, I can't pick her brain. But, yes, Barbara. So, if they're asking the question, then uh, the hot and cold is that frío and... Caliente. Frío. So frío. the same words as for... Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Yeah. Frío is cold. So it's the way, once you consume it, what it does to your body. And being a female or male also is part of that equation. So it's a whole very different way of, of understanding food, your, your relationship with food and what it does to you. It's not about calories, it's not about you know uh, minerals, not about proteins, it's just a whole other way of conceptualizing. So if you have the opportunity to ask her, find out a little bit more and, and then report back to me. <laughs> I'm still curious about that. Okay, but just, yeah, it's for me to know. Okay, in terms of, this is something I'm coming from Colombia. I don't know because I know you've been in other sessions and what you've been told. And often people go when you um, when you go to a store or you go to a pharmacy, especially in smaller towns, you buy things in like one size unit. Um, you know, you're gonna wash your hair Saturday, and your family cannot afford it. You're not rich, you can't afford a big, you know, value size shampoo. You have to plan pretty much when you're going to wash your hair. You buy a little cushion of shampoo. And that's what you can afford or your family can afford. You take turns who's going to wash their hair. So it's a different way, again, of conceptualizing daily life. So how the economy affects people in different economic strata. Uh, so this is single size portion. It's not like the hotel portions. That, that No, that's a whole other thing. You know, you go to a hotel and every, you know, every day you get a new little bottle and this is different. You gotta plan for this to be able to, you know, afford to get a little cushion. Same as with the band-aid. You go to a drugstore, you injure, injure yourself, you go to the drugstore and you you buy one band-aid because that's all you can afford. You're not gonna have a box of band-aids sitting in your in your bathroom cabinet. It's not it's not that affordable for the lower income people. Same with an aspirin. You have a headache and you go and buy one aspirin. It comes in a single size little package, and that's drugstores are used to this. You know, you buy one. That's all you can and, and you wait till you have a headache and hopefully you have money to buy that one aspirin. When I uh, believe you were, they talk to you about water, so consuming water. Often when we think of bottled water, it's not really in a bottle, it's in a bag. And so you can't really close it again. So when you, you have to commit to drinking it, okay? <laughs> so once you open that little bag, you gotta commit to drinking the whole thing because there's no zippers, there's nothing. That's the way it comes. Not everywhere. There is bottled water in, you know, in, in Guatemala and in Latin America, but often that's the way, you know, what we call bottled water will be in a little bag. So just so that you're prepared mentally, you know, prepared to see some differences in terms of the way things are presented to you. I don't know. Maybe this is useful or not. I just thought <laughs> little differences. Okay, a little bit more about the commerce and the economy. Just. Some of the natural resources are nickel, rare woods, fishing, hydroelectric electricity, industry or sugar, textile, clothing, furniture, chemical products, metals, rubber, and tourism. Products for exportation, coffee, sugar, bananas, other fruits, cardamom, vegetables, um, and clothing and products for importation, combustibles, transportation, uh, machinery and equipment, grains, electricity, construction materials. And how many of you have heard of CAFTA before? No, anybody heard? You've heard of, of NAFTA? North American Free Trade Agreement? So this is CAFTA, it's the Caribbean. So countries of the Caribbean, who came together and you know have this um, have this agreement in terms of commerce and how it's supposed to help the different countries 
you know, in terms of export and import for the benefit of the countries. So in 2006, uh, Guatemala joined CAFTA, which is the Central America Free Trade Agreement. Uh, and it's an agreement between Central America and countries of Central America and the US. And these are the countries, aside from the US, that belong to that. If you did the reading that I gave you, there's a, a page, there's a whole page on that, and it actually talks about the many different ways in which it's been detrimental to the Guatemalan uh, um, economy to have, you know, uh, signed this uh, disagreement, especially for the lower classes. Again, for the poor, for the wealthier, they have, they have, uh, you know, done really well, and so they're really glad they the country signed, and so they, it's done really well for the economy, for the the ruling classes, but the indigenous and the and the lower, the lower class Latinos have not benefited from this kind of treatment. Other parts of the economy are maquiladoras, or what we would know as assembly plants or, or sweatshops. And there are many of those, especially in Mexico, and it started in the 1960s. Uh, many in El Salvador, but also Guatemala. And that has been, that has really brought a big shift for women women to be able to move out of the domestic realm for in terms of income instead of babysitting or, or going and cleaning houses or doing laundry for others, um, then this is a whole other way of, of making or of earning a living, of being independent for single mothers. A lot more in the population of El Salvador and Mexico. Guatemala is different because of the indigenous population and often they stay together as communities families and communities, whereas in Mexico, there was a lot more migration for women and single women um, to go and work at the maquiladoras. I could, you know, I teach a whole um, one third of a semester just on maquiladoras, so there's a lot I could go into, but just so that you're aware that it has really shifted, not just in Guatemala, but in Central American countries, has shifted the way the economy uh, happens for women, single women, single parent women. Um, and for the indigenous, it has been a shift too, but not that drastic. But it has affected the economy of Guatemala. And here's just a, another image. So it's not just clothing, there are electronics, they put radios together, computers, all kinds of, you know, all kinds of things that you can imagine, machinery. So we often think of clothing women you know, producing articles of clothing and then to be exported, but it really is about all kinds of things. Everything from, yeah, TV sets and radios, computers. Um, so it's, and, and one of the positive things has been that women have had to, they didn't know how to read and write, they had to become literate. And then they, they were able to, to uh, learn some other skills. So it's a semi-skilled labor. So they, you know, they were able, but there are a lot of other, you know, there are some negative aspects that come with that, but I'm not going to get into all of it. But just so that you have an idea that it is part of the economy and that women are, they make up the main uh, labor force in the maquiladoras. Maquila for short, in case you hear. Um, I'll do this next little bit and then we'll take a, a little break. So just for you to understand the way um, the cities were developed in most of Latin America. And the, the best pictures, I couldn't get any picture to really depict what I wanted to. So they're from they're from Ecuador, Colombia, and Puerto Rico, but just to, to show you what, it, it is the same idea, the same concept was using Guatemala. It's when the colonizers came and started to establish little towns. It's the same, replicated in small towns and in, in urban centers the way towns and, and cities were being developed. So architecturally and for city planning, the way space was meant to be used by people. And so the traditional structure in Latin America is the square, the main square. And usually it may be, you know, as in North America and other parts of the world, you look for somewhere where there may be a river, a lake, um, the land is, you know, later on when we were, or at the time, you were thinking of transportation by horse, by buggy, by later on with trains. So people who are establishing cities think of all these things, right? Boats, ships, um, 
And so there will be a flat part of, of, of the territory, and that's where you will have that square, and around the square will be usually the church, which the church has played a very important role in Latin America, so it's a, it's a structure and establishment of power. And then we'll have the governmental uh, buildings, whatever it is in a small town, it may just be one little building where you have everything, you know, you know from the, the mayor's office to a jail to a, you know, all of it will be together. To, um, and then the wealthiest families in that area will have their homes in the rest of the part of the town square. Okay? And as you spread out further and further from that main square, you can tell the economic status of a family. Or, so the poorer you are, the more on the margins you are, the more on the periphery you are, the more you are at the center, then it depicts your political power, your economic power. And so that's a way to conceptually and physically and architecturally understand um, the way society or um, spaces were organized. So this is, this is a, from, from Colombia. And usually at the center there will be either um, a big fountain or a big, the emblematic tree of a place. And in Guatemala it's the Seiba. So if you look for that when you're in Guatemala, it's, the tree is Seiba. is for the tree and Seiba. If you look for that, it's their emblematic tree in Guatemala. So either we'll be at the center of the plaza or we'll be a big fountain. That's the way traditionally the structure is. So here we have, this is in Quito, Ecuador, so it's their plaza. So you can see, or a monument, sometimes it's a monument to a liberator or big historic figure. And often there will be kind of a park element. People go and sit, and it's a place of gathering too. But you have to understand that it's it's a lot, it represents the, the structures, the building of, of wealth and power that are around that. Families, individuals, and then structures, government and church. <coughs> and this is in Puerto Rico, so it's a traditional fact to that. And the colonial homes and I hope you do get to see some I don't know where you're going there will be it's very different from the architecture here in Evansville other parts of the US that I've been to and so usually it's, <coughs> to enter the house will be from the street so you go in from the street it looks like it's a tiny house right you see two little windows in the door then you go in and there's it's a big square inside and the patio is in the middle it may be only one floor or there may be two floors and inside is this richness and people will go in you have the kitchen the bathroom and then the the bedrooms are all outlining with the big kind of patio in the center okay so it, it looks like it's very small from the outside but it's a whole other area and if it's a wealthy family usually the wealthy families own these big colonial homes there's the servants quarters the washing, you know, for doing laundry before washing machines came to be. So there's still some of them have these rooms with just big um, tubs made of stone and where you, you know, people will wash clothes still by hand. Many families still work with clothes are washed by hand or on a stone uh, slab. So just so you have a conceptualization, some of them are just gorgeous, really gorgeous. If, they, if they've been well kept, it's just truly beautiful the way uh, these houses were built and designed. And the way people, if you can imagine being uh, in a family in one of these houses, the way the dynamics are, it's different than, than the way houses here in the US. Because you know, you go into this bedroom and you can tell when everybody comes out or who goes in. You know, it's just a different way of interacting with people just because of the way space has been designed. Outside on the main, on the main square, in the 